All right, we're good. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen, O Lord and our King. Please bless this gathering, be with us, and reveal to us your light. We know that Christ is risen from the dead. He is truly risen. Allow us to take this Paschal joy with us in every place and in every time that we go so that we can lift your name up on high at all times and in all places. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto who ages of ages. Amen. Today, everyone, we have a very special blessing. We have our first guest since we've been doing these digital programming. Um, we have with us our good friend, Dr. Michael Wingert. Uh, excuse me if I slip up because he's also my friend, so I'm going to, I might say Mike, but he is Dr. Michael Winger, the Dean of Agura University. He is a semeticist. Before we started recording, we had a question that I'll, I'll repeat now. So the question was, how many languages does he know? And him and I both chuckled on the inside because the easy answer is a ton, a lot. <laughs> Uh, you could call him a polyglot linguist philologist or philologer. I'll let him choose the word that, that he likes the most in introducing him. But he is within our communion. As we know, Christianity began in Antioch and in Alexandria and Rome. Those are called the first seas or apostolic thrones, the places where the people Jesus put in charge put people in charge and our legacy is from there is specifically from Antioch where people were first called Christians as a way of mocking us but we always flip things on their head we flip ideology upon ideology for the glorification of God and so that that tradition is the authentic Antiochian tradition not to be confused with our cousins the Greek Antiochians the authentic Antiochians are called Syriac and it is in fact their school of biblical exegesis, which in large part we inherited in the Gezrite in Ethiopia and Eritrea. In fact, I was just hearing one of our Ethiopian scholars last night at the Fra Fermentius Theological College in uh, Makala in Tigray speaking about this in Amharic, and he was explaining firmly that it's very well known in the Ethiopian exegetical tradition that it is a continu uh, it's a continuity from the nine Syriac saints who originally came to Ethiopia in the 400s and 500s. So that was kind of a, uh, a long <laughs> introduction, but Dr. Michael, welcome to our, our gathering and, and please uh, feel free to answer that question and, and in general, talk to us about the Syriac tradition writ large for for those who need to learn. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, Christ is risen. Qom Mashiho Min Qabro. Amen. As they say. And um, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, a note about the, the places where I teach. I teach at UCLA, as you know, and I also teach at Agora University. And so Agora is an Orthodox institution. And um, it was started by a number of Orthodox scholars in different fields. And um, we've been slowly growing since 2012. Um, and um, we're presently, you know, um, seeking accreditation. And um, we're a university, but we're a university that is um, moving forth from the tradition of Orthodoxy. So basically from our traditions, those things that unite all of us, um, and as you mentioned in our, our kind of our chat room beforehand, um, our scholars are Egyptian, Coptic, um, Syriac, Armenian, Ethiopian. Um, and so really, you know, they're people who are grounded across many domains and traditions. And um, that forms the backbone of every other field we're going to be expanding to in the coming years. Um, so that's that. As for how many languages I know... Um, <laughs> The question is, you know, like, what do you mean by no? Uh, so let me ask a question back to, you know, the, the person who asked. And I think um, I actively speak probably, I don't know, between three and five. Um, and that's in terms of sp like speaking conversation. At my home, we speak English and Aramaic. So... Um, one thing we'll be talking about today is this word Syriac. And as, um, you know, my dear brother Hanok mentioned, 
Um, I'm from the Syriac Orthodox tradition, and Syriac is another way of saying Aramaic. Aramaic as a language, uh, you should know it from your Ge'ez or um, Amharic or Tigrinya Bibles. Um, you have all these phrases here and there from Jesus that are in this local language. You know, mm -hmm. he'll tell the girl to get up. He says, Tlitha qom. Uh, a couple of years ago, I yelled that to my daughter in the hallway as she was like <laughs> laying on the ground. I'm like, whoa, I just quoted the Bible. I didn't realize it. Uh, but that's, you know, that's the Aramaic or Syriac language. Um, when he's on the cross, he quotes Psalm 22 from the Aramaic tradition, actually. And so um, Syriac refers to Aramaic of a specific period and a specific region. Um, that region is a place called Edessa. Um, it's modern day Urfa in Turkey. Um, in Syriac, it's called Urhoi. And it's sort of the literary language, if you will. Um, and it's really, you know, it's that time circa um, the Christian age and the early church is when that dialect um, is most prominent. And that becomes our liturgical dialect. So that's like guys for the, you know, Tewahedo tradition. Um, you know, we have naturally our, our local um, languages from... Um, from Ethiopia, Eritrea, but your your prayer language is the classical. So it's the classical Syriac that's our liturgical tradition. Um, and really the difference between Aramaic and Syriac is one of sort of Aramaic's a broader term. Um, maybe if we could call something Ethiopic, you know, um, but Ethiopic is basically is the same as, as um, today, but like you know, maybe it includes other languages and traditions and variations of you know, the languages of Ethiopia. Aramaic's like that. Aramaic's a broader term. Syriac is a little more specific. So um, that's just to set up how many languages do I know. I've probably studied 24. I at one time counted them on my CV. Um, but studying and, you know, actively using are two different things, right? And so, like, I've even started to dabble with guys a little bit as um, Hanok knows, and you know, our friendship is kind of grounded in um, language study and similarity, and uh, we do a lot of comparison. So I may throw out questions to everybody to see kind of like what the what the guy's version is of something, um, just to see how it compares with the Aramaic, the Syriac. I was thinking about that, Mike, if you don't mind me jumping in. Um, when you mentioned Psalm 22, we actually spoke about it either last week or two weeks ago in this session. And um, the way that it's transliterated in Gez is Elohe Elohe Lamentan Sabachthani. Uh, how far is that? Is that a is that a butchering of the of the Aramaic there? It sure is, my friend. Um, <laughs> it's not that, it's not that bad of a like you're not going to the butcher shop, right? Uh -huh. like you're not quartering, you know, and um, giving me like the rump um, yeah. in, in your version. Um, and that may be, it's a question of where does the his Bible come from? Does it come from Alexandria and thus through a Greek intermediary? Or does it come more yeah. from Aramaic and the, the nine saints as they would pray? Um, because the Greeks, you know, certain sounds are not, uh, they're not strong in Greek, like the sh sound, mm -hmm. right? Um, it becomes s. Uh, um, and I, fake, I think that issue happens in Gez as well. Maybe has had the sound, but like it flattened over some time. I don't know. Um, you have a number of Giz, S's, right? Giz would retain it. The issue is you when you um, no longer have like a Giz people, what you have are Amharic speakers and Tigrinya speakers. And if they're not learning it well enough, and you know, language, nat I don't have to tell you, language naturally changes. Um, sometimes they bring the biases of the language that they know better into that guz, and then it becomes retained in the way people have that guz. For example, our word for king that even Kendrick Lamar would rap about is nugus. And yet the person who's next in line is my grandfather's name. The person who's next in line to be king is nagash, right? So that doesn't make any sense. 
that it switches from an S to an SH. So that and Mangesha and a few other forms of historical evidence by some scholars at the uh, Institute for Semitic Studies have shown that that S is actually supposed to be an SH. And so it should be Nagush. Uh, but it's so hard for people to understand that now because they've lost a lot of those, those distinctions. Yeah, in yeah. fact, that root, um, you know, maybe we'll just let this talk kind of flow organically um, between us. So I was going to talk sort of about the Syriac biblical or exegetical tradition from Please. the Bible today. And I think, um, you know, the talk we're having can weave in and out, you know, of that. And rather than, I don't, who cares about giving a presentation? Let's just talk. And um, so the example you used, um, Negus, this would parallel the um, Aramaic root Ngasha, right? So um, again, you have this Shin sound um, at the end, the Sh sound. The same with, um, you know, what would you say for the word holy in Gaz? Maybe you'd say Kedus or something, right? So you've got Kedus, which, you know, is a emphatic K versus Kadisho, Kadisho in Syriac, which is a glottisized Q, right? So you have uh, the same <laughs> phonological territory. Um, and then this, you know, whether it's Kidasi or the um, Kidus, that S sound is an original SH sound, you know, Kadish. Um, Hebrew, they would say uh, Kadosh, etc. right? So you've got this final SH sound. And um, it's an interesting thing, like, to talk about how the fathers of our respective traditions actually approach and encounter scripture. Um, they do this in a way that utilizes language because language reflects thought, but it also contains mystery. And, um, you know, our two traditions are actually the two living Semitic traditions of Christianity. Um, apart from that, you know, you have a wide range of Christian tradition that you know, is largely founded on the Greco-Roman tradition. And um, that's where it survived best, you know, historically. And so a lot of the literature and um, scholarship that comes out, you know, has a Greek slant. And even our friends in Egypt, you know, uh, they're basically Southern Greeks, in the city of Alexandria, right? You go have to go um, up the Nile a little more to start encountering more like specifically Egyptian Coptic you know, um, um, sensibilities, right? And, so, and pause for a moment. For those who don't know what up the mile, uh, up the Nile means south, means towards Ethiopia. For those who don't know, the Nile flows from north to south. And so upper Egypt is in the south from their point of view because the globe is round, because the globe is always going like this. There's no objective view of the earth and the european view was that europe was on top but you know there have been even different po folks who've made different maps <laughs> with the, the direction the other way and so when dr michael says up the nile he means you know towards nubia towards deeper into to africa away from the the mediterranean and the other greeks let's just let's call just... it like you know when they head ethiopia lee or ethiopia <laughs> yes. grade or something right when they're going back home <laughs> Uh, you know, you get more, you know, less Greek, more indigenous African, um, <laughs> that direction. And so uh, this all to say that our traditions um, in the, you know, the, the Syriac Orthodox Church and the Tewahedo tradition in Ethiopia, Eritrea is um, very rich in terms of how language expresses theology. And so we will regularly see, um, oh man, I see somebody. Yeah. I see That's somebody. The, by the way, yeah, I Orlando is the I one who introduced mustache. us. Yeah. Orlando is the one who introduced Dr. Michael and I years ago. So he's, he's cheesing for that reason. Yeah, that's right. Christ is risen. Uh, Orlando Calrissian, Duran Donna Greenhill, my friend, I miss you, brother. Um, in any case, <laughs> I'm jumping in and just talking about Syriac, um, Exegetical yeah, you traditions. can give them a Paschal greeting, man. You can, it's okay. <laughs> go ahead, go for it. And uh, 
Yeah, well, we're talking about you know our, our different traditions, and but how they actually they they perceive the world differently, and so th what that means is they encounter scripture differently, um, and language plays a big role in the encounter of scripture itself, and so the way I would really try and um, focus our attention is that it's not about the text itself, but that the meaning that the text holds, and. That's kind of like a common sense thing, but I, I think we don't actively think about it so much. You know, we, we tend to be textualized, um, and especially, you know, living in a Western country where the traditions are, they largely revolve around Bible study, right? Like studying a text, a text as a text, rather than, you know, the text as the fruit of meaning. And I think that that's the key, you know, with understanding the Syriac tradition or the Gaius tradition. Um, and so words, words play beyond, you know, what um, they might in a basic textual study. Um, an example I was reading the other day, I'm preparing a, a long-form study on the book of Exodus. And um, in chapter 1, um, St. Ephraim is commenting about the midwives, right? And so um, he says that Pharaoh had tried to turn those who give life into those who bring death. Now, it's interesting because in Syriac, the word for midwife um, is haitho. So the midwives, haiotho. Uh, how might we say life in Gaius? Uh, is it a cognate, Hanok? It is. I want. I want to open it up to the folks who wants to jump in. It's the same word in Tigrinya and Amharic for those of you who know it. Say it. Life. You what? Yeah. There you go. So we have a cognate there, and that is related specifically to the word midwife. You know, and here in English, if we're studying a text, right? We're studying in English. We're looking at a, a text that gives us a term, and that term. Um, reflects a role, a job, a duty, right? And the midwife delivers babies. That's effectively what a midwife is. But it's literally in Syriac, the one who is um, channeling life, if we can say it that way. And so that's a, a different term than midwife, right? Midwife versus the person channeling life. And so the way of encountering scripture in the East really looks at the the broader um the bigger picture through language and language reveals things that it just wouldn't in a basic textual study and so that's a that's a very common thing in our tradition um i think one of the other things that's interesting about the syriac tradition and of course we all share these these traditions so you know it the extent of it in the coptic or the the Tewahedo tradition um, is a, a local question because I know we we have effectively every tradition, but the Syriac tradition really relies um, heavily on meditating on this ontological chasm, basically like the our way of being, right? The the reality of the fact that you know God is truly incomprehensible. If we we confess something finite, if we're confessing a finite God, and we confess a finite creation, we're really delineating the difference. We're really making uh, clear that difference between everything that's infinite and the finite. And in that, like theology must be contemplated within a the the bounds of our limitation right and so that that's very prevalent in like the thoughts of ephraim and other syrian fathers and so you have this approach to theology that employs paradox so paradox being um a little more than typology i don't know Hanok, if you've talked about typology with people before in in your, your study script uh, so I have I have definitely with Jonathan and, and Delton. I don't know about with everyone um, uh, else, but yeah, like I always emphasize in our discussions the primacy of the Older Testament. The way that I say it is, you know, to to go the reverse direction of Marcion, uh, but not too much. It's scripture 
uh, the, uh, scripture, when the New Testament authors are talking about it, is the Older Testament. Scripture for us is the Older Testament and the newer. And so by virtue of that, if I could use a mathematical equation, the Older Testament is greater than or equal to, not lesser than, the New Testament. And the things of the Older Testament, which the New Testament authors considered as scripture, for them, that was the Bible, that was scripture, speak about Christ, are foreshadowing or doing types of or, or themes of Christ, to, to your point. Yeah, that's yeah, it. That's, that's it. So typology is just that. It's being able to see something in the past that has a meaning for something later, right? And so it's in pondering like the paradox within um, a typological setting that's at the core of Syriac thought. And so um, it's brilliant in a way because it's not the way the fathers read scripture um, in the Syriac tradition is not something that's necessarily an intellectual exercise but a a spiritual encounter right it's less it attempts to understand god less than to experience god right so the focus is on the divine experience rather than specifically understanding how do we experience god and that's that has a greater value than understanding now mind you i'm not like i'm not dissing understanding god or the the Greeks, let's say, or the people who are preaching in Greek, right? Even our um, our Egyptian fathers, you know, Athanasius and Kyrillos, they are they're very much Egyptian African people, but they're using the Greek language to preach to people who think in Greek. Okay, mm -hmm. and so um, the idea of being a little more dogmatic, you know, with their encounter of scripture, um, and the same with the Cappadocians and other people who are. Who are writing in Greek, they're going to focus on understanding God, whereas the, the Syriac tradition focuses more on experiencing God. And so encountering the scripture is actually more of a poetic encounter. And I don't know how much you, you talk about St. Yarad and you know other people in the um Tewahedo tradition who I try to uh, mention him in every breath. Um oh yeah, buddy. I if if I may in this moment, so Dr. Michael, this is uh this is where I believe you are uh, probably more polite than I am in this regard. Um, <laughs> in regards to me and some of the folks that I podcast with at the Ephesus School, the way that we describe it, and it's even funnier because they're in the Greek tradition, and yet because they're Greeks of Antioch, they have the greatest and utmost respect with the Syriac. In fact, Father Paul Nadim Tarazi, who's one of them, is uh, published with Gorgias Press in that huge volume of the Antiochian and Syriac fathers. And he, he actually writes about John Chrysostom. So John Chrysostom writes in Greek, um, Cyril of Alexandria writes in Greek, Athanasius writes in Greek, and, and they are the best, and Basil the Great I, and, and Cyril of Jerusalem are the best who wrote in Greek. But I will tell you, a lot of times that understanding as you spoke of it in my opinion is far too intellectualized and the greater we try to do that the greater the room for error is which is why i invited you here because like you said us being semitic the ethiopian and eritrean and syriac tradition binds us by our language like we are bound in a sense by our language to not escape this worldview. In addition, the various Jewish groups and Targum or Tirigwami, it's Targum in the Aramaic, Tirigwami in uh, Giz and Amharic, um, tradition of exegeting or digging out and extracting the meaning, the meaning as you're talking about of scripture, it, it, it binds you and limits you in a way that the some of the Greek philosophy was boundless. Our brother uh, Abel or Habel uh, was always laughing because he notes that I seem very ecumenical to a lot of people, but the two people that I'm the least ecumenical to are in the contemporary sense, Joel Olstein, and in the ancient sense, Plato. And I think it's because that 
over intellectualization later led to the to the Roman scholasticism and the Protestant scholasticism. Yep. And to me, ultimately, almost ultimately leads to godlessness and secular humanism and postmodernism, where everyone has their own truth, and ultimately nihilism, where where people find meaningless. I, I think that's where it ends, and it tends to you know rely on the strength of the intellect of the person. Whereas what I see in the Syriac tradition and the Ge'ez tradition, which inherits it and, and then, you know, takes it forward, doesn't just mimic, but mimics and then contributes, is the, uh, this kind of practical, like practical poetic truths, like you said, like Ephraim the Syrian, who you mentioned several times, and Qaddus Yared or Jared of Aksum, they're both famous for almost exclusively preaching through their hymnography. They use spiritual songs to reveal the the older testament and the newer testament it's almost like sugar to let the the medicine be swallowed um more more easily and so i i have a strong preference for for those fathers that you've mentioned because that and you know i, I was laughing because like really i i go in on on plato and all of his works you know <laughs> i was children and i myself was was guilty of a lot of uh, Platonism, because I studied philosophy in um, in college. You know, I I could even discuss like as a as a quick example, my view of the soul was wholly Platonic. The nefs or the nefesh was a wholly Platonic view, and at uh, twenty years old, on the cusp of twenty one years ago, I I got a, a tattoo with all of this Platonic ideas, and the crazy thing is that because I chose to do it in Amharic, which is, you know, also clothed in giz, it was bound by the language that I had and the way that I tried even bringing that meaning to the table was ineffective. And later, this is crazy, I must have been influenced about it without even realizing I was reading Genesis in Amharic and I came across something that is virtually what is tattooed in Genesis chapter two, verse seven. It says, and the, the Hamaharak and Giz is very funny. It says he goes off on him, like he blows on them. And he creates Hyao Nefs, the living soul or the living breath of life. And it, that goes exactly to the point of what you are mentioning with the midwife as the channeler of life. The way in which our languages received mm -hmm. this, and it goes to also the, the theological controversies of a lot of the councils, you know. Our, even our cousins in the Church of the East and our own, you know, uh, beef with the the, count, the Council of, of uh, Chalcedon. It, it goes exactly to that that uh, biblical tradition of interpretation that you mentioned. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a wait. Sorry. Yeah, yeah jump in. Ask something real quick. That's okay. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Hey, uh, nice nice to meet you, man. This this is a great conversation, especially in light of last week around slavery. But um, I just I just want to uh, underscore how much I love when Hennel goes in. I mean, he gives Joel Osteen a lot of smoke as well as uh, <laughs> Plato. And it's an amazing thing to watch. But but it, but, but if, if you don't mind, Hennel, just really quickly, because a lot of our friends and brothers and sisters and doctor, you as well, if you don't mind, uh, turn to Joel Osteen. And, you know, um, and it's hard to like counter that because, I, you know, I, I can't just say, well, Heno gives him smoke every Sunday, and I trust Heno. So, uh, that's that. <laughs> but literally, can you just break down a little bit as to to keep talking about the language of Plato? But like, what 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 are the things we need to and advise people to be careful of in these two? I mean, I think I know, but it's also like I would rather hear it from you guys. Doctor Michael, do you, do you have a quick response? I wouldn't want to put you on the spot. I could give a. a 30 second response, but if you have a, a, a one, I would love to pr give you preference uh, here. Well, maybe you can respond um, and then I will kind of pick up where I was going. Perfect. And then hopefully that would kind of intersect with uh, um, Habil's question. I, uh, I, uh, I believe that, I believe that. By the way, Abel, if you don't know, your name is a vanishing breath, a fleeting breath. <laughs> yeah, the story of Abel is very short, but it's very beautiful. Wow. Um, so the Let thing is, start taking notes. Hold on. <laughs> in Greek philosophy, what happens is abstraction versus practicality. So the Greek philosophers will bring to the table 
their own allegories, their own dreams, their own views, their own everything, and they'll expound upon words that are not in the scriptures, that are not there in the language, and they just keep creating words and, and they add words and they base things on the forms. One of the basic ideas of Plato is that everything exists. It's like here is a cup, which is an instantiation or a manifestation of a perfect form of a cup that exists in the realm of the ideas. And each one is based off that. And so Plato begins with theory. And from theory, he tries to take you to practice, which is your life. The Semitic languages all have what are called consonantal roots, like KBR, which is greatness or honor, kub, like subhat, SBH, which is glory, right? Like MY, my, which is water. And those Semitic consonantal roots um, express grounded realities. So in Semitic languages, you begin with a grounded practical reality. Like uh, recently, yesterday, in my, my talk with Miret, we talked about Sheol, or Hades, is the place of the dead. That was a real place where people were buried. And they use the real grounded practice to talk about theories. So they go from practice to theory, whereas the Greeks go from theory to practice. And so your practice or your tinkering should inform your theory your theories that you bring to the table should not inform your practice. That that's that's the short of it. Can I add something on that? Go ahead, oh. Um, not to interrupt you guys. Great to see you, Mike. It's been a long time. Um, I'm a musician. For all you guys that don't know, and this it's the same thing with musicians and Greeks have done the same thing. Like the Pythagoreans to put all this theory, where you have musicians of the East that just I mean, it was like. When you really get in the music, it, it's like a lot of us improvisers, it, even though we're into theory and all that, that's not why we play music. We play music because it's a part of us. It's the foundation of, of what goes into it. But people start theorizing and just taking the soul out of it. I don't know if that makes sense. I just thought I just wanted to interject that, you know, because no. I, I, as, a, as a musician, and music teacher and an improviser, like it's the same thing, man. Like a lot of people will try to theorize a lot of that stuff and it becomes so 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 stagnant you know yeah. i hope that makes sense that's what it reminded me of what you guys were saying you yeah. know it's like the spoken word rather than the living word you know like i don't know i don't know if i make i you hope i'm making, making sense. sense and um, yeah yeah it, it makes a lot of sense <laughs> i mean if you look behind me i got nothing but instruments so it's like i totally understand in regards to that because um it, it, it's one thing to play from your heart but i i guess it's 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 kind of coupled a few things. It's like we study the theory, but we still mm -hmm. got to use our ear and come from our heart. But yep. sometimes if we don't have that theoretical standpoint, it's like sometimes we can be limited only if we come from the heart. Because sometimes I feel like that theory, it sets up a structure like, oh, okay, cool. If I do this, it, it, it creates tension. Okay, this one creates dissonance. Yeah. So it, it it's an interesting uh, mixture, but yeah, I, I totally dichotomy. Yep. I think yeah, yeah. By the way, if y'all didn't know each other, uh, Orlando and Delton are both music teachers. So oh, wow. <laughs> what's up, That's you guys? <laughs> oh. <Delton. laughs> I saw that yeah. cue board and, last and week. And hopefully, you all I was like, it. man. <laughs> wow. So, um, yeah, that, that whole thing. Ho hopefully, trip, uh, Doctor. <laughs> hopefully, Doctor Michael, we didn't stray too much and are able to use those examples to, to highlight where, where you were going with it in regards to the, the exegesis? Yeah, I think actually it's, it's nice to encounter um, conversation beyond because you get it, right? And I think Orlando's example, you know, the music without the soul is really a nice way of putting it. And what I would add, rather than getting in on a conversation, um, like Plato and even his descendants and, you know, the Neoplatonists, is that in the early church, when you were encountering this Greek material, you are largely, like, we have it preserved because it's literate and because it's 
writing to a very specific crowd, people who think a certain way, people who've been reared and grown in a um, philosophical tradition. And so that could be the result of um, what is surviving tends to be more higher brow in that case. Whereas mm -hmm. what our tradition reflects might be more at the level of the people, people who aren't, most folks, let's be honest, most folks are not deep intellectuals and that's okay. Like it's not a condemnation of them. Most folks are just regular, you know, the grandma who, the auntie who goes to church and prays in truth and love is probably a better theologian than, you know, most of us sitting around, you know, trying to talk about how Plato foreshadowed, you know, Socrates foreshadowed Moses and, you know, things like Justin Martyr and other early church fathers discuss. Because uh, real theology is about this divine encounter, you know, to find union with God, you have to encounter God, right? And that's a process and a movement that we're continually moving toward. And so poetry in our traditions um, would tend to be a more common um, device than producing an intellectual treatise, because I can teach you a, a poem, right? And through that poem, I can teach you theology. I can teach you the scripture. So um, in our communion hymns, this is from Moriakum de Sarug or Jacob of Sarug. Um, there's a couple of lines that I thought I'd share with you because I, I love it. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> um, so we start like during communion, there's this chant and it's chanted a few different ways. Like one is kind of um, long and drawn out and another is more festive. And, you know, the, the lyrics are the same, right? And it translates to something like, he whom the fiery angels fear to look upon, you behold him in the bread and wine on the altar. Um, the hosts, that is the, the heavenly armies, clothed in lightning, right? So these, you know, these angels who the Bible describes as, you know, being bright and on fire, things like that. The hosts clothed in lightning are burnt if they behold him. But with confidence, the scornful dust partakes of him, right? And so it's a way of, you know, contrasting the angels with man, you know, the divine realm and these beings, these luminous beings that are close to God, and yet they don't have the ability to partake in him in terms of communion. And so this poetry is a little easier to remember. Um, another stanza from this poem is, when Zion set up the tree to crucify the sun, there the tree that gave birth to the lamb had sprouted up. So what's that tree giving birth to the lamb or ram, right? Here we have this Genesis imagery, you know, this Abrahamic imagery where they find this um, plant that has a ram in it. And it further goes on to say, um, where the nails were driven into the hands of the son, there the hands of Isaac were bound for sacrifice, right? And so that idea of using poetry to convey um, these types, these images, this scriptural experience that's very much, this is about Genesis. This is about Abraham um, offering his son Isaac. It's about the sacrifice of the animal. Um, it's about the function and use of the tree. And yet being able to see that, to see that instance from, from history and then looking forward to, you know, what became the salvation um, and offering of the Eucharist later on, right? That's basically trying to encap encapsulate the entire scriptural experience in a few lines. Now, how do you do that? How do you, how do you convey theology and, um, read up on or exegete scripture, scripture to folks who can't even read, right? I mean, let's be honest, maybe mm. you guys know some people in the in the home country who are not literate. Oh, you know, yeah. Maybe they live on farms, maybe they're, you know, more rural people. Um, and that's not a dig at anyone. I mean, I know people from Syria who are illiterate, right? And um, lit mass literacy is a relatively recent phenomenon in human history. I, mean, I don't know the so numbers uh, right now, Dr. Michael, but when the Derk, the communists, took over in 1975 in Ethiopia, 80% were illiterate. And so you have to understand the vast majority, 99.9% .9 of the history of our tradition, from which this all sprouts from, as you say, is the overwhelming majority 
was illiterate, which is why in our tradition, the word minbap or to read means to read aloud. It's to speak. The word to speak aloud and the word to read. There, there's no such thing as greedy reading. You don't read by yourself in a, in a nook and cranny in your room. You read out loud to the community as you have the duty to read for those who cannot. You said it. I mean, it's the same with the word, um, you know, kraya. So, um, a karyana, karyana in Syriac. I'm using the Eastern accent. But so I go back and forth between Western and Eastern. For those of you who don't know, um, Syriac has different accents. The Western accent is what my church is strongly based in. The, um, but many Syrian Orthodox live in the East or the Persian Empire where the accent's a little different. And at home, my family speaks a modern Eastern version rather than the Western version. So, karyono. Um, or karyana means a reading, but reading out loud to call out. And in fact, if you've ever, you know, met Muslims or had a, a Islamic friend, you know, you would hear this like, "Oh, the angel told Muhammad, Iqra, you know, recite or read." He's like, "How can I read?" or whatever. It's the same root. It's the same verb. And so, karyana actually is probably the um, antecedent for the word Quran, which just means a church lectionary for example, right? So reading is not an exercise in your home or under a tree. We don't necessarily have a highlighter for Bible studies and circling things. I mean, I'm not saying that's wrong, but like in our tradition, Bible study is an encounter. It's not, uh, it's not an intellectual exercise per se that we, you know, sit and read. Um, and that encounter, and actually the word you said, menbeb, you know, that's that should be related to the word for a prophet, right? Naba, this oh. person who his job is to call aloud the to proclaim the divine, right? To proclaim the divine truth. That's what Naba should be. That's so funny. I I never connected those, but yeah, in the creed we say Zanababa Banabiat, who spoke by the prophets. Amen. Or who spoke by the people who speak, I guess, or who rec who recite who recited through the reciters. <laughs> All valid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and that's it. And that's you know, um, that ability to to convey the faith to folks who aren't going to have the skill set, right, to sit and read scripture. Uh, how do you do that? Like you're, you're someone who's um, in the church ministry. You are someone who, you know, you're a monk, you're a priest, whomever you are, um, you know, a, a nun, mother of the church, you're conveying, you know, you're a mother in general, like right? who teaches their children, right? The mothers teach their children. How do you convey faith, spiritual truths, study of the Bible um, to others if the vast majority of the population, and you used a figure from the 20th century, right? Go back further. I mean, honestly, like our churches are that old mm -hmm. where, you know, call it, I mean, we don't even start at 33 AD. Let's be honest. We're both like rooted in Jewish tradition. So <laughs> the Ethiopians and the Syriac, you know, um, or the Tawahido tradition and the Syriac tradition are, you know, much older. Um, and our timeline, you know, it goes back to a time when most folks don't read. And what does that mean for encountering Scripture? What does that mean for Scripture, literally the thing written, the thing that's to be read? It means we ought to encounter Scripture. And so that's kind of that. that's the, I would put at the core of the Syriac um, experience. And that's what we share, you know, between our, our two traditions in our one common church, right? Like, my church is your church and yours is mine. And, I mean, um, you know, it's not because I like Ethiopian food um, and you like, you know, kebab. Um, it's because, you know, like this is, it's one thing, one people. And um, we don't highlight ourselves enough. And I think maybe to go back to Abel's question, you know, like the two, the two parts of the example you used, Hanok, with Plato and Joel Osteen, um, well, I just completely lost it when I said Joel Osteen, like my mind. Is <laughs> but isn't that the trick? Um, yeah. No, I, I think, you know, the key is in 
knowing how to communicate with people. And on the one end, you have a highly intellectual tradition, and on the other, you have a very simplistic tradition. But the real Orthodox tradition, and again, I'm not dissing anyone you know, of our Greek friends or people from Greek traditions, like those are very useful and they're part of our history, like straight up. But we cannot lose sight of the fact that our traditions, which are, have become, well, it's not that we have been sidelined, it's that we're more hidden, like we're more like a pearl hidden away than something neglected. Mm. And I think that we're a value to the rest of the Christian world to know that there is a middle ground between like, Platonic thought or intellectualism, philosophy, and, and, you know, things that are so simple that you're not even scriptural anymore or whatever, you know. I can't really comment on on uh, Pastor Osteen because I don't, I don't listen or I don't know any of that. Um, but I'll make the assumption that it's very simplistic, right? It's uh, <laughs> pro anything prosperity gospel. If you've, if you've seen any televangelist, Creflo Dollar, oh. any, anyone who's prosperity gospel, uh. you know. Give me money and God will bless you. It sounds good to me. <laughs> uh, hey, Mike, remember that impression that you used to do of those guys? <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to yeah, say that's, that. Yeah, that's more of a... <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about that, guy. <laughs> no, that, that's more of a Jimmy Swagger. I'm getting myself. That's more of a Jimmy Swagger. Oh, man. <laughs> you got to go back to the 80s when, you know, Orlando and I were rolling in L.A. <laughs> Um. Hey, Dr. Mike, can I ask uh, can I ask for your opinion on the um, on the Jewish study of the Talmud and how that might be um, you know related to you know, the discussion of um, over intellectualizing? Because that's you know, it's interesting to me because it's where our entire tradition comes from, um, but it's also very very. Um, deep thought exercise and, and not so much of uh, a spiritual exercise. You know, I think, um, you know, just wrapping up my previous thought, um, having something in the middle, right, that is both intellectual and simple, that's where poetry comes in. And our poetic tradition and our use of poetry is what distinguishes us by being able to convey really deep thoughts to people um, through lyrics. You don't forget your songs. You go to church and you remember the Kadesi long after you've gone to church and it's ringing in your head because we're conditioning you to pray without ceasing and yet pray this intensely theological encounter and experience. And where our traditions, we both inherit a, a strand of Judaism. Um, and I don't know, I think <clears throat> I would distinguish um Judaism as a whole with common Jewish traditions um in particular call it the rabbinical tradition that we're going to find and and some of our our writings really do play the same they um have the same rhythm and way of reading out loud scripture um you know i i'm better at um midrash and midrashic literature um, than I am Talmudic literature, but the you know spending a lot of time with um, you know andemta right in the Ethiopian tradition is very similar to um, Jewish tradition and rabbinical tradition, midrash and rabbinical readings, um, andem you know, and then you know the varacher in Hebrew and in rabbinical Hebrew, like they have the same tradition of encountering scripture and, and going detail by detail. But I think what the issue with that is, and I mentioned this in one of my classes, is that it looks to the text rather than the meaning of the text. In other words, the spellings start to matter. You know, one of them is, you know, in... Um, I think it's in Genesis Rabbah, which is part of the Midrash, where the rabbis say, you know, um, in commenting on the first lines of the book of Genesis, so in Hebrew and Syriac, by the way, they're almost parallel. Um, the first line, you know, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. He says, Bereshit bara Elohim et with So Bereshit 
means in the beginning, a long time ago, at the start, whatever, right? Bereshith. Um, <clears throat> so the rabbis go, well, okay, why does God start with a Beth, the letter B, instead of an A, right? Aleph. Um, and it's interesting, you know, because these letters are actually numbers. Before we have the Hindu number, the Hindu numerals that we use today, um, they would use letters. You know, the Romans did something similar with the, you know, I, you know, one, two, three, you know, and then it goes IV for, you know, so they used um, letters to convey numbers. And so it's the same with the Semitic tradition too. So why does God start with two instead of one? Why does he start at the second place instead of the first place? And so they're looking at the text itself and trying to understand it based on, on textualization rather than maybe a, uh, a broader meaning, and I think, um, or a, um, we'll just call it a broader meaning. There's a better term. So they would look at the text as actually bearing the secrets of meaning rather than um, what is it as a, as, a, uh, as a whole. And I think what Christianity does is it looks toward the, um, encountering the word of god specifically as an encounter as a as a living experience rather than something that's textual and so you know even when we think about the term for word itself right word in whether it's the syriac or the hebrew um i'm, I'm not sure how to say it in guess how do you say word al. again al al there you go. <laughs> it's a little different. So, um, you know, in in Hebrew, at least, it's davar. Davar means word, um, but it means a matter, affair, a thing. And so, like the word of the prophet is a. It's what are the the affairs, the matters, the things of the prophet that he's saying, right? It's not something that is necessarily textualized. It's more a reflection of meaning. Than a reflection of text. Texts have spellings. Spellings change. Um, spellings have variation. And then there's also um, synonymous language, right? So synonyms are used. And gosh, our our two traditions are big on synonyms. Um, oh yeah. And there's mystery. You know, like those words tell a story, but it's not like they're they're coded secrets. And I think that that's if Jonathan. It, if I'm I'm answering you and yet staying on topic at the same time, I think that would be the difference is, you know, words aren't coded secrets, but they tell stories. So we talked, we started our discussion <clears throat> talking about the Negus as a king, but that's not a king, right? That's your taskmaster. That's the guy in Exodus who's, you know, whipping the, the Hebrews, right? So what's brilliant in the the story of Ge'ez and the Tawahido tradition is that you will use that term for your king right but you use the word amlak for god and so amlak this would be malko in syriac malko of course we call christ malkom shihu christ the king malko means king um literally like the it, it's its real meaning is something along the lines of owner, right? Boss man. Um, and so that can be used in terms of, you know, a king or God, because who truly is a king? Like, who is the real and only king, right? And that's what I get from the Tawahido tradition. The only real king is God. And so the person who's here on the earth is the Negus. You may equate them as king, but the Negus is not a king, because only God is king. Amen. Right? That's what that sign above his head reads. He's crucified for what? What's his crime? He's being king, you know? Okay, he, he is the king. He's the real king, you know? And so um, our words tell stories. Um, that's also the case of the Jewish tradition, but you may find it, you know, more text-based to where text itself is that bearer of secrets rather than the meaning of um, the terms of the stories, and um, that kind of takes us back to the the point we started with, right? Is that the idea that we're not text based? We don't encounter scripture um, 
from the position of text, but from the position of what that text means, what that text reveals about reality. Yeah. Um, so to jump in on that on that point, while you get a breather, um, I'm actually. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can follow up, Jonathan. I'll have a brief uh, interjection. Um, I'm actually in the process of writing a book. Father Paul Nadim Tarazi has this thesis, which I am extending. His thesis is that if you understand the scriptures properly, that the entirety of the scriptures can be understood in Genesis chapters 1 to 11. He has an, a hyperbolic extension of that where he says the scriptures can be understood from uh, Genesis 1 to 4. So here I've got a funny little book here in Giz. It's the first eight books of the Bible, of course, including Genesis, but also including Mas'af Kufali or the Book of Jubilees, which is one of the um, Giz books that were retained in our tradition. The Book of Enoch or Henoch and the Book of Kufale or Jubilees are the two books that are only fully extant found in, in Giz. The fragments are found in, in Aramaic and in Greek and in and Coptic, I'm sure. But uh, Hebrew, the, Hebrew, Hebrew. The, the, full, the full Hebrew for, for Enoch as well or just Jubilees? I don't. I wouldn't go full on anything in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Maybe the Book of Isaiah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 So that. Yeah. That's. That's where a lot of those discoveries were made. And so, this point that Mike is making is exact. Exactly what. What I. Uh, I'm. I'm pointing to. In fact, I get carried away with my. My synonyms. I love the synonym tradition. It. it, it you know, we pick it up. I, I'm sure that's where we picked it up from. But it is a Semitic thing. And so, you know, at one point I even said, you know, um, and some people may be startled by this, you know, because they have a lot of negative associations. But, you know, you could think of the MLK or the Amlak or the king as, you know, the capitalist of the universe, you know, the one whose whose capital is all of space and time. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mike has, has written before about our liturgy where we refer to um, – you know, the Coptic church uses this Greek term, pantokrator. Those who like Latin-based words in English say God is omnipotent. Those who like the easier way will say he's all-powerful. The way that we express pantokrator or om omnipotent or all-powerful is ahaze kullu, the one who holds everything in his hands, which is just like that great American song, he holds the whole wide world mm -hmm. in his hands. Um, so that, that, you know, that, that's a, a point to, to, um, to Jonathan's question that we view scripture as a totality that is telling us a story in Romans 15, Paul says, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning or for our instruction that we through the patience or endurance or perseverance and comfort of the scriptures, the word that Dr. Michael used earlier, might have hope. So the, the Jewish Talmudic tradition doesn't necessarily always push that interpretation. And one thing to, to never forget is that Christianity is a Jewish tradition. That's why I always emphasize the OT. Paul was a Pharisee. And so there are various groups in the first century Palestine, Dr. Michael mentioned the Dead Sea Scrolls it was found in a cave of community of people called the Essenes. The Essenes are one group. The Gentile Christians are another group. The Jewish Christians are another group. But hopefully, as we get into Galatians, we'll see how they're supposed to be one group. The Zealots are one group who end up leading to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD because they want a physical uh, fight with, with Rome who has colonized them. Who, you know, who is over them, who is ruling over them. Um, you have the Pharisees who are the largest group, and then you have the, the scribes who hold the highest positions of, of authority. So that, that you know, they're all those different groups are interpreting the Bible in different ways. So, uh, yeah, Jonathan, did you have your, your follow-up? Hey, before, before, before Jonathan jumps oh, in ahead. on his question, go ahead, go ahead. I just want to, you know, illustrate how, how close our traditions are, and this is probably from the Creed, um, you can tell me if, you know, 
is in the, I know it's in the Kadesi, but is it also in the creed, you know, when you say the Father Almighty, Father yeah. Pantocrator? Yeah. Um, yeah. So we would say Abu Ahid Kul, you know, and Abu Ahid Kul is, you know, um, what Abu Ahaz Kulu. In, in he holds so, everything. It means he holds everything in his hands. He, the one who holds everything, who is grasping yeah. ahad, um, you know, kullu, everything. Yeah, ahad yeah. Kullu, exactly, you know, ahad exactly kullu. the same. So, um, it's a beautiful connection there. Jonathan, go ahead and ask the follow up. Yeah, uh, your educated guesses are all right. And by the way, your your accent, especially on the word andimta, was flawless. You know, people say I pass for Ethiopian. Um, I was hoping for more of a Gondari accent. Um, <laughs> I, speak, but yes. I don't know. Not yet. Not, <laughs> not yet. It's like, where are you uh, from? Oh, I'm from northern Ethiopia. That's why. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead, yeah. Um, so I forgot my question, but your answer to my last um, was was very helpful and uh, a beautiful, succinct. Uh, Explanation that I was I was really looking for the the overemphasis on the on the textual, um, especially in you know in when in reality languages and words change over time. It's a it's a very it, almost absurd thing. Um, so thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for that um, like right on the money bullseye uh, <laughs> reaction. You know to the to the answer. It's um, it's an interesting thing. And like, I mean, I love Jewish tradition. I love it. Um, and I think it's it's profound and, and contemplative. But I, I also think that, you know, it um, directs our time a certain way. And I, I, I prefer um, our experiential approach, you know, to theology, to the faith, to encountering scripture, to encountering reality. Um, yeah. My my favorite point that Dr. Michael has made so far is, I think, the point that I want to re-emphasize, that I want to double click on. Uh, to you as well, Mima, thank you. Um, what I want to emphasize that he said is there is one end of the spectrum who has an extremist over-intellectualization, and on the other end, it's uh, it could be an an extremist, you know, cretinism or you know, lack of literacy and an allergicness to reading. And so, what we try to occupy and what we try to do is this middle road, this third way. And the way he put it is so great. So check this out. You have me with my limited Giz knowledge and my Amharic knowledge, which is not so limited digging into my tradition in Giz and Amharic, which is a rare thing to do. It's an elitist thing. You have uh, Dr. Michael digging into Syriac, Hebrew, Arabic, various Aramaics, which Syriac is related to, Hittites, Akkadian, and I'm sure I'm, I'm missing some to, to, to answer some of Delton's questions before. And by the way, Delton knows some Arabic too, so that, that's why he's curious, and some Portuguese. So we got some quite some language lovers in this group. Um, but what is Dr. Michael doing? He's presenting the fruits of his labor in these elitist languages to the people, to the masses, through Agura University through the Alexandrian Journal and through the Alexandrian Press that they run there and through teaching people who are going to be business leaders and who are going to be all members of society so that we don't compartmentalize Christianity to Sunday at one time in one building, but so that Christ is the lens through which we view every single asset of our life and, and when we encounter that. And same thing with me through my podcast series, that's what I'm trying to do. And I'm also writing. Recently, I, I wrote as an example of this about Lusiaret, Jared of Aksum, who we mentioned earlier. In his Soma de Gua, which is one of the first texts people learn, he says, Yisum Ain. Yisum Lisan. Yisum Wa Izanani Yisum Msamia Hasum. There are a ton of Semitic cognates in there that I'm sure Dr. Michael will pick up. Som 
is a Semitic con uh, cognate. It's fasting. So he says, may the ein, may the eye fast. May the lisan, the tongue, or in general, the mouth or the way of speaking, fast. Wa izanina, may our ears or my ears fast from hearing hasum. His choice of hasum is hilarious. I, I crack up when I hear it. At the same time, it's beautiful. And when I hear one, one of our local fathers, Abba Kalamwark, who is a master of the liturgy, sing this, Yisum Lisan, Yisum, Yisum Ayn, Yisum Lisan, Wa Zanani Yisum, Msamiya Hasum, I'm taken away. Like the melodies in my head, I can't produce it with my own mouth because I'm not a great singer, but I can understand it when he says it. And what he's saying, Hasum, it means evil. So it's the, like the classic three monkeys like that you see in, in multiple traditions, right? Not even, even outside of Christian traditions. See no evil, speak no evil, hear no evil. But the word he uses for evil shares a root with the word pig or swine, hasama uh. or asama. So he's saying, keep your eyes from swinery, keep your mouth from swinery and keep your ears from swinery. So you have this vivid, vivid poetic example. Like he said earlier, any grandma can understand that you see a pig rolling around and wallowing in mud that is filthy. So he takes that practical reality that all the people could understand. And it's a simple biblical truth that we need to feed our eyes, our mouths and our ears with the scriptures with the word of God, as much as talk. But if we can read, we need to dedicate our eyes to looking at the very words that are not words by themselves, but words that convey a message, a word of life to us. If we are speaking, we shouldn't speak our own words. We should speak the words of God. And if we are hearing something, there's so many things to hear. We should be hearing the words of God. And so in, in this simple middle of the road or third way method, we are able to then present a, a thinker's view for everyone to understand. So it's like an elitist who is working in a populist way. That if, I, if I can describe what Dr. Michael said earlier, that, that, that's how I would phrase what him and I are doing. It's why we've been friends for years. And, and I thank the Lord for having our brother Orlando, Abdes and Lassi, <clears throat> introduce us for, for that many years. Yeah, man. You guys are awesome. Yeah. Both of you. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. And it's funny that basically all of those words were cognates, you know, and so... Um, you know, with a little training of the ear, I think one could jump from Ge'ez to Syriac uh, pretty easily and vice versa. And so one day, you know, God and time permitting, you know, I'd love to jump back into my Ge'ez studies and um, slowly but surely. Slowly. Likewise, we're going to have to teach each other. <laughs> exactly. Um, Dr. Michael, do you, do you have any closing closing thoughts? If you, if you do, I'd like to uh, give you the space to give your closing uh, thoughts. If not, we can open it up to any you know final questions, comments, or or concerns. Yeah, I'll just um, I'll I'll reiterate a refrain I've kind of said multiple ways, but same in meaning I think, and that is you know when you you take the time to go to liturgy or read a text. Um, your purpose ought to be the divine encounter. And do you encounter God through reading a text? Um, I think that's a, a good way of doing it, right? I'm, I'm not condemning that. Um, encounter God through reading that text, but encounter him through, you know, our musical tradition too, because it, it conveys the meaning of the text and it preserves it in a way that doesn't require sight right? That doesn't require the skill of being literate, um, but, you know, of more basic human encounters. In fact, um, this idea of collecting the scriptures and condensing them into poetic theology um, is something that th the fathers um, once commented on. If, if you've ever heard of St. Jerome, um, or, um, Hieronymus, I think we would call him. He once says, 
uh, about Saint Ephraim that it wouldn't matter if the world had all lost the scriptures, if we had lost the entire Bible because we have Ephraim's poems. Amen. What? Right? You tell someone that today, like, get this guy out of here, you know? <laughs> but what is it, right? It's because you can, it's the meaning that matters, right? You're not reciting something word for word, especially, okay, we're functioning in English right now, or like, you know, 95% of this conversation has been in English, right? But, you know, <laughs> and it's English of our time. Let's not forget, you know, language moves, the tongue moves, pronunciation moves, um, texts move. English was spelled differently in, in different ages. And guess what? English you know, it, it's a language far removed from these Semitic cultures. And so yep. text is good. Like I'm not, text is good. Study the Bible, study it in English, study in Amharic, in Tigrinya, in, you know, uh, Guraginya, is, would that be the, yeah. you know, um, Oromo, you know, Somali. I don't care. Study it in all of these Horn of Africa languages and in, in Syriac, Arabic, Turkish, doesn't matter, you know, but at the, at the core, connect with the meaning it's the meaning that matters and it's the meaning that's the reason for the preservation in text in textual form and we can convey that all sorts of ways our traditions just happen to use poetry to connect with the hearts of people and create an encounter um, that's sustainable you know uh, across generations intellectual capabilities um, educational backgrounds etc 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 so that's that's it. You know, we can open it up for questions, do whatever. Um, I, we've been talking a long time, and God bless you guys for like hanging in there. That's um, that's cool. I respect it. You know, um, Joe Rogan fears us because of the length <laughs> that we can talk about this stuff. But, you know, we love them all just the same. That's so funny. Yeah, uh, Jerome, one of my favorite of the Latin fathers. For me, it's Jerome and Ambrose of the of the West. Jerome, I, I give the most respect to because he took the time to learn Hebrew and he used that time to give us, you know, the the proto versions of what eventually became the Latin Vulgate. And so the fact that he went out of his way to learn Hebrew, whereas a lot of the others stuck themselves to either Latin or to Greek and they, they confined themselves by by not getting that Semitic experience. So I, I always have the utmost respect for him. So thank you. Uh, for sharing that. Yeah. I want to open it up. Um, anyone else have any final questions, comments, or, or concerns regarding everything that we have? And we will, we will, I will at least in closing read at least the first one to two verses of Galatians, which will be a preview for us to enter Galatians next week. Go ahead, Jonathan. Um, so, um, I don't know how, how um, quick of a question this will be. Go so ahead. Go ahead. Advance, it'll take a, a long, long form explanation. Um, so, uh, I recently, um, started reading, uh, Father, uh, Paul, uh, Nadim Tarazi's book, um, The Rise of Scripture on the subject of the authorship of Genesis. And, <clears throat> uh, yes, that's, that's the book, you know, uh, uh, truly it, it, uh, I, I will say his, his thesis on the authorship of Genesis shook my faith because I, um, I mean, you know, I even though I, I had more of an allegory understanding of um, you know the Adam and Eve story um, than uh, than uh, like a, a lot of a lot of traditional Christians who who read it as strict history, um, I had still attributed the entire book to Moses without question, and here comes this um, you know this giant in the church who I look up to and I listen to his podcasts who um, comes in and says that he doesn't think Moses is the author of Genesis, um, but he, he attributes it to, um, you know, the, uh, the Semitic populations living, um, you know, under, uh, <clears throat> under the, the, the thumb of, I think it was the, the Persians at the time who um, authored Genesis, at least as a way, as a dig at their oppressors and a way to introduce them to the law. So, um, and you know, now, now I, I can't help but but keep uh, searching for answers to this question. Um, 
because it's so different than how I originally understood the first five books of the Bible being written by Moses. So Dr. Michael, I was interested in, in your take on the authorship of um, the, the Torah, at, at least um, through um, Deuteronomy. Um, so Jonathan has invited me back for another podcast. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, <laughs> I appreciate that. I mean. Actually, I, I teach a class that deals with this topic. Um, okay. And so rather than rehash the entire class, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll kind of just ask you some questions if, to think about. Um, I don't want to comment on that book because I haven't read it yet. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know specifically. I'm just listening to what you said and um, responding to that. I think things we need to be aware of are words like authorship, write, like W-R-I-T-E. What does it mean mm -hmm. to write something? What mm -hmm. does it mean to be the author of something? What did it mean um, in previous generations? Are our traditions um, scholastically today mm. entirely congruent with those of the past? Is our way of conveying and telling history the same? And at what points did we change our focus um, for that? Because without giving you, you know, spoon feeding you the material, the the answer um, to that is we're continually changing and developing even today. Like um, you read older scholastic material, it doesn't have footnotes, it doesn't have bibliographies, right? And so that's mm -hmm. one way that's, you know, in more recent times, um, we tend to attribute um, sources and not necessarily even authorship, because what does it mean to author something? Um, so I'll leave you these questions uh, without getting into, you know, like a okay. new podcast. Yeah. Um, because it's a, a definitely it's an interesting topic, and there's a number of things that you mentioned that could each be a class, such as you know the production of Genesis during the Persian period, um, mm -hmm. you know the use you know and function of the terms in the different books of um, the Pentateuch. Um, what does the word Torah mean? Is Torah mm -hmm. the Pentateuch, or does Torah mean the instruction? right? So these mm -hmm. are questions you should ask, because Torah itself doesn't come to mean Pentateuch until much later. And um, mm -hmm. prior to that, like the word just means instruction, that, w that which was thrown to you and given. And the cool thing, um, what I love about Syriac is Syriac tends to preserve these words that are distinct in um, Hebrew. Like, you know, when you read an English Bible, for example, you know, you'll sometimes see Lord with lowercase letters, or you'll see it in all caps, right? When it's in all caps, it's referring to the divine name. Um, but, you know, if you have a Greek translation Bible, it's just going to use kurios for, you know, that in each case, Lord or Lord, and you can't really distinguish it in the same way. But Syriac has two different words for it. Um, the same with Torah. We'll use, when we want to talk about the law, we'll talk about the namuso, which is just a cognate, or it's a loan word from Greek, nomos, um, which means the law. And then we have the word uretho, which is effectively a translation of the word Torah. And so um, these are, there's a lot of questions um, that you know, we could explore through your question. There's a lot of lectures and podcasts and um, things we could do. Um, if you've got a bachelor's degree, you could join my program and get the you know, the answer um, if you want to pursue it. And um, it's one of the things I talk about um, where, you know, I, I think um, the answer that you presented from um, Father Paul is too simplistic. And I think that um, knowing our tradition in light of the Semitic world, and not just our tradition, you know, an Orthodox scholar presenting us um, the findings of uh, contemporary research. Um, it's it's more developed than that. It, it's a more sophisticated conversation. 
Um, so yeah, sorry. I'm not going to give you more, but I, no, I, I hope that I, at least I, whets I, your I, appetite, I, gives you some direction. Actually, yeah. um, you, you, you mentioned for us, like, uh, could you put your information so we could fo possibly follow up? Um, I I'll guess send an email. I'll, I'll send an email. I'll, I'll give you his information. I'll, I'll send an email with everything, including um, Dr. Michael, the, the talk. Do you want me to share the link to the talk as well? Yes. Yeah, like all, all of that. Yeah, this is this is really great. Um, it's always okay. encouraging me every every week to come on here um, just to, you know, not necessarily just not be stagnant. You know, I think sometimes for me, I can just become complacent. Like, OK, I know God is God. The Lord is Lord. And that's hey. But uh, whenever I'm on here, it's like it's challenging me to, um, you know, go deeper in an understanding. Um, yeah, so this is really encouraging. I, I, I really, truly appreciate this. Thank you. Regarding the authorship. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. What did you say? No, it's just said, thank you. Pray for us. I mean, so regarding the, the authorship of the Pentateuch, right, years ago in Genesis specifically, I had a similar type situation. Uh, I, I heard his book in audio form uh, back in 2016. And um, the the interesting thing, and, and I had heard of that actually before with Jeannie Constantino back in 2013, who has another great podcast, Search for the Scriptures. But I'll give you three figures. And I love the way, Dr. Michael, the way that you answered it is perfect. You know, again, it, it is a, a subject that deserves greater length and context and nuance. All of these things do. And I think that if our faith is not grounded on you know, the, the actual truth of the matter, it's not worth having that faith. It's worth having the faith after even knowing the things that we do. And there are things that would scandalize us and shock us. But ultimately, this is because more and more, we need to be drawn back into the world and the context in which the scriptures were written. And sometimes we don't even know why we have the biases we have. In the introduction, to the recent English translations of Alec, uh, Athanasius the Great or Athanasius of Alexandria's On the Incarnation, C.S. Lewis says, we should switch off book to book. We wanna know, he said, if you wanna know the biases of your time, read a book from your century, then read a book from a different century, then read a book from your century, then read a book from another century. And by doing that, you will know what the biases of each sentence uh, of each century are and some biases are specific to a time and a setting some biases are universal earlier this morning i recorded my podcast episode for the book of james chapter two or the book of jacob chapter two and in there he warns about partiality towards the rich and the poor so the type of partiality towards the rich and the poor universal across <laughs> the ages but each age has its own biases so i'll give you three figures and examples of those figures and that is going to be our, our preview introduction for galatians for next week and I'll, I'll close with the prayer and and i thank you dr michael for your time so i'll read galatians 1 just verses 1 and 2 paul an apostle not from men nor through man but through jesus christ and god the father who raised him from the dead and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. We will explain a lot of that and we'll get into that next week. And eventually I'll redo my podcast on it. Cause again, years ago I, I had episodes on Galatians, but in any event, Socrates, Jesus, Paul, check this out. Socrates never wrote anything down. Whatever anyone in the world knows about Socrates, they know it through Plato. Jesus never wrote anything down. Whatever people know about Jesus is through the apostles who wrote about him. And I don't know what percentage I'd give, but I'll say at least 80 to 90% is contributable to Paul. And we'll get into that with Galatians. Third, within Galatians later on, you see some of what Dr. Michael was referencing. 
you see Paul saying, look with what large writing, with what all caps, they don't even have caps in these languages, but look with all caps that I'm writing with my own hand. And why does he mention that? Because the other Pauline letters are not written by the hand of Paul. They're dictated by Paul to his helpers, some of which wrote gospel accounts like Mark and who we received our apostolic authority in Ethiopia from, from the throne of Mark or the Sea of Mark in Alexandria, and Luke, who wrote the gospel of Luke and Acts. We find out they are disciples of Paul who are dictated to and write things for him on his behalf. To extend that analysis a little further, not to spoon feed you too much. I know you're a great person at looking into things. He's got a bachelor's. He's also got a JD. So Pauline also means the school, the Pauline school. So what happens if the person is in another place, in another city? What happens when he's in jail? What happens when he's in jail and there's no video chat, there's no phone to make sure that you could get continual dictation? Can something still be called Pauline if Paul is in jail and he's not even directly dictating it to you, but he's taught you for several years and you are learning this, this school of exegesis or interpretation from him. So those, those are my final thoughts on the subject that will hopefully help you um, with your question. Let's gather our thoughts uh, for prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Believing and trusting in the Holy Trinity and standing in the presence of our Holy Mother, the Church, we deny you, Satan, and all of your works. And for this, Sion is our witness forever and ever. We thank you, Lord, for allowing our invited speaker, Dr. Michael Winger, to share his scholarship with us. We know that our Syriac and Ethiopic or Guz traditions are all from one spirit, from one God and one faith. We've received one baptism, and we thank you for the time that you've given us. We pray that you are able to speak to us through the hymns of our tradition and through the Holy Scriptures so that we can walk every day in our lives, no matter what we do, lifting your name up on high. As you taught us how to pray, we will pray to you, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. With the salutation of St. Gabriel the angel, O Our Lady Mariam, peace be unto you. You are a virgin in your flesh and a virgin in your thoughts. Blessed are you amongst all women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Rejoice, joyful one, for God is with you. Pray and beseech your beloved Son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, that he may grant us mercy and forgive us our sins. May the love of God the Father, the grace of his one-of-a-kind Son, and the communion of the Holy Ghost remain with us forever. See you all next week. Uh, hopefully, Dr. Michael, you're always welcome. You're going to be a re